Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sociology 399, Sociology, Fear and Social Anxieties. Today, we are going to discuss about the deliberate creation of fear during Stalinism in the Soviet Union. We are going to explore how fear was systematically manufactured and wielded as a tool as a tool of social control during the Stalinist leadership in the Soviet Union. Stalinist regime deliberately created culture of fear to maintain power and suppress opposition. Fear was used to control public opinion, suppress dissent, and enforce conformity. The regime employed various tactics to instill fear, including purges, ex executions, gulags, censorship, propaganda, and a pervasive secret police force, which called KGG in the Soviet Union. Fear was used to justify extreme me measures, uh, such as uh, forced labor, mass deportation, and famine in the country. The personality cult surrounding uh, Stalin amplified fear, making him seem unstoppable or unfollowable leader. Fear, fear, um, created, fear was created in every aspect of social life, from public trials to random arrests, creating climate of constant anxiety and uncertainty. Understanding how fear was deliberately created and exploited during Stalinism offers insights into the sociology fear and social anxieties shedding light on the mechanisms of social control and manipulation. Throughout this class, we are going to delve into the strategies employed by the Stalinist regime to create and maintain culture of fear, examining the impacts of uh, fear on individuals, society, and the political landscape. By exploring this dark chapter in the history, like we did same thing in the Canadian residential schools, we aim to gain a deeper understanding of power dynamics at play and the lasting effects on social anxieties and fear. During this class, we are going to theorize fear in society and see the similarities and differences between Canadian residential schools and uh, Stalinism in the Soviet Union. So we are going to do a few things uh, during our class. So we are going to compare, compare uh, Canadian residential schools the fear during the Canadian residential schools and who experienced what kind of fear to the fear created in the Soviet Union. What kind of fears the government or Stalin experienced which led to oppression and strict control in the Soviet Union, which is similar to what we observed in the residential schools in um, Canada. Then we are going to talk about what, what is uh, Stalinism, rise and fall of Stalin, terror, terror and fear during the Stalinist time in the Soviet Union. Also, we are going to theorize fear during Stalinism at the end of uh, our lecture. Here are some of the questions we are, we are going to consider uh, for our lecture. Also, these questions are really good to reflect on uh, what we are looking for. And also you can use them for preparation for your uh, tests or you can um, take some of them and explore for your annotative bibliography. So what are the key features of colonialism in Canada and Stalinism in the Soviet Union? How did both systems use violence, fear, and control to maintain power and suppress, suppress opposition? In uh, colonialism during, uh, during colonialism in Canada, 
there was a there was fear created to suppress uh, opposition from indigenous peoples of Canada and the USSR we are going to discuss today. What was, who was the object of fear? What were the economic and political motivations behind colonialism in Canada and Stalinism in the USSR? How did both systems impact the cultural identity language and traditions of the affected groups. Who are affected groups? Indigenous people in Canada and people of the Soviet Union in Soviet Union. What were the similarities and differences in the both, uh, in the ways both systems targeted specific groups? How did the resistance and survival strategies emerge in both contexts? We talked about the survival and and um, resistance in residential schools. And we are going to talk today um, on uh, yeah, yeah, this topic, in this context. What are the ongoing legacies of colonialism in Canada and Stalinism in the former Soviet Union? How can understanding historical contexts inform our responses to contemporary issues like systemic uh, oppression, cultural er erosion, and social injustice in both contexts. Okay, all right, let's get started. Who is Joseph Stalin? Joseph Stalin was born in 1878 and he died in 1953. Um, he, he didn't have a too, too long of a life but he could destroy many lives during his lifetime, I would say. He was a Georgian revolutionary and politician. He had very harsh childhood and um, very scarring marriages. Uh, there was uh, some stories about um, his wife dies and his, in her, um, what it called, uh, in, beside her, um, body, dead body, he says, with my wife, my last hope or last um, trust to humanity died or something like that. He was devoted to Marxism and he, he was Russian social democratic labor Marxist party. He led that in 1898 to 1904, he organized labor strikes and he was jailed. He co-edited a Georgian Marxist newspaper called Proletariatis Bird Zola, Proletarian Struggle. So he was pretty active politician during his time. In 1905, Stalin meets Lenin a rise to the Central Committee to Editorship of Pravda in 1912 and 1917. And there was a, you know, there was a revolution in 1917 and he was very active part of that, that revolution. Lenin became a leader and Stalin became one of the governing foursome in the country. 1941-1942, um, that was final years of Lenin, and Stalin was very close to him. Leader of the Soviet Union and the Communist Party between 1924-1953, that is the nightmare time in the Soviet Union, and Stalin died in 1953. That is a very short uh, history of Stalin. So after Stalin came to power, first his first fear was the opposition. So 1936 to 1938, he was doing all kinds of things to target political opposition in the Soviet Union. There was assassinations and fabricated evidence against his uh, people um, opposing his party. There was uh, all kinds of uh, older Bolsheviks were replaced by 
younger politicians. He got rid of them. They purged many, many older politicians. So they are not there as, you know, as opposition. And there are some facts just makes your, um, makes you think, what the hell? Like, how could he do that? There was about 35,000 officers who were shot or imprisoned with the accusation of serving his opponent, Trotsky. The, some story says uh, the Stalin was very scared of this. Another politician called Trotsky. He was just about to take the government from Stalin, but Stalin was um, more, how can I say, power thirsty and did everything he could do to keep the um, keep his position. Ordinary people were required to inform about sus suspicious friends in the family. This is not a joke. Everybody in society were scared of everybody else. That's the kind of fear created in society that creates kind of atomized people. Nobody trusts nobody else, which is very important for totalitarian control. If people have good connections, they cannot, uh, cannot be controlled uh, in a totalitarian regime. So one of the elements of totalitarian control is propaganda in atomized people. There is mass amount of people, all of them very atomized. There is no trust in society. There is no traditions. There's nothing holding them together. Usually, usually there is no religious organizations or any kind of unions in that kind of countries. And then there, there was also a secret police um, called KGB. So people was also very scared of KGB because there was overnight coming and arresting people. People always wondered about who was gone that night. We will be talking about that a little bit later. Between 1937 and 39, an average of 1,500 people were killed daily. That is um, not a small number. Altogether, 700,000 people were executed. Um, what is Stalinism? Good question. Stalinism is the most precise word used to describe the ideology in legal system policies adopted by Stalin. Everything about his regime together is called Stalinism, which is uh, based on centralized totalitarian and uh, totalitarian control and the pursuit of communism. Stalinism is the main means of power uh, there was power in everything, in laws and regulations, control over um, secret police, and all these people created so they can inform one another. That is just a power infused in society or control infused in society um, during the Soviet Union from 1927 to 1953 by Joseph. Stalin. What was the motivation behind the deliberate creation of terror? So we are just keep saying that the name title of our class is the deliberate creation of terror or fear society, fear culture. The violence of the late 1930s was driven by fear. Stalin's government feared attack from different countries around around the uh, surrounding Soviet Union. It was Japan and France and United Kingdom, Poland, Romania, all kinds of countries are surrounding Soviet Union um, could attack, uh, attack Soviet Union at that time because Soviet Union was just establishing and Stalin feared from that. Um, also, Stalin was a very ambitious um, politician. And that ambition created or um, was behind the creation of culture of fear. 
certain workers and peasants who had reasons to resent the regime because there was a lot of wrong done towards them were also viewed as enemies or dangerous, potential dangerous to the government uh, ruled by Stalin. Also uh, in 1924, five republics in the Central Asia was added to the Soviet Union. And those countries, they were Muslim countries. And then there was the, the transformation in society was so tremendous. And the Stalin feared from people in that culture, uh, countries uh, resisting that. And there was a lot of resistance. For example, in 1920s and 1930s, um, women were freed, like women wore before had head covers in the Central Asia that was removed at that time. And many Muslim women, uh, Muslim when, men was against that. So there was many Muslim women lost their lives because of that. And there was trans, uh, transformation in every aspect of society in Central, uh, in Central Asia. Uh, there was transformation in the education, healthcare system, uh, how people dressed, how the culture was um, spread in Central Asia, and also like the new things were being introduced by the Soviet Union, which was quite new for um, Central Asian countries. The cultural genocide was similar to the what colonialism did to uh, indigenous peoples of Canada. Or oh, at that time, um, scientific atheism was adopted by um, ideology of communism. It was part of communist party, which pushed Islam away from Muslims. So that took away big part of their identity. They weren't, uh, they weren't uh, allowed to practice any of their religious practices. They weren't allowed to do their traditions. And only, oh, actually that's wrong. Islam only survived as part of the tradition. They weren't allowed to do, um, allowed to use their religion in their lives. In some sense, allowing a little bit of tradition was kind of a little bit different than uh, colonialism in Canada. However, it wasn't any better. There was tremendous changes happened in society. People lost their language because Russian language became the main language. People lost their alphabet because alphabet was changed a few times uh, during the Soviet Union. And the books and all these publications people had in uh, before that were not republished. So that was lost. People could not read them. They could not connect with their history. And their history was rewritten by uh, uh, the scholars of the um, Soviet Union, which called Sovietology. And there was a um, huge tremendous purges and executions during the Stalin's time. Stalin ordered white, uh, widespread purges, executions and imprisonments, creating the climate of fear and uncertainty in society. People, if you wanna control people, basically you need to create fear so people do whatever you say. That was the rule um, used by by um, Stalin. Also, there was a secret police, that's KGB, that is called NKVD, and everybody in society were used as informants, as I mentioned earlier, which creates atomized society. People don't trust one another. They always monitor one another, fostering an atmosphere of suspicion and fear. When you can create that kind of fear in society, then there is no connection. If there is no connection, there is less resistance or no resistance against 
the um, leadership or the government. So also there were forced labor camps. The Soviet Union, labor camps in the Soviet Union is more look like uh, the Nazi Germany, how they used um, concentration camps. It's not, not too sim similar to the um, ways indigenous people treated in Canada, but there were also some forced labor camps in Canada as well. They were also using imprisonment, imprisonment and um, that was used to terrorize um, perceived enemies of the regime. And who were the enemies? Actually, everybody in the Soviet Union was the enemies of uh, Stalin. And you can see from this picture over here that gulags during Stalinism was a widespread thing. There was um, men's camps and there were women's camps. They lived like, you know, they are imprisoned. Um, that existed from 1918 to 1991 until very recently, and uh, 27.8 million people, according to um, this book called Gulag, um, a history um, was imprisoned in or used in sent to Gulags. Um, Anne Applebaum uh, wrote this book, the, the, the Gulag, a history that was actually um, widely accepted and celebrated books about um, labor camps in the Soviet Union. It received quite few um, recognitions actually. The Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction, Britain's Death, Cooper Prize, the book was also a finalist for the National Book Award and also it was the National Book Critics Circle Award, LA Times Book Award. There was quite quite few actually. I that is a um, very good thing that um, that kind of book was written about concentration camps in the Soviet Union. So what does Gulag means? That's acronym, which is, which means main administration of camps in the Soviet Union in, in Russia at the time started in 1980s as already we mentioned and the most people in the gulags were the oppositionists of the revolution after stalin came to power in 1927 gulags became um ob object of terror and and concentration camps and also they were grave for Stalin's power struggle. Um, it, there was few purges during the Stalin's time in the Soviet Union. Uh, late 20s, there was one, one big purge. And then after, dec after a decade in late 1930s, 1906, 1907, there was another purge. So every time when Stalin purged people, whoever just kind of claiming in the political uh, ladder they were purged and Stalin wanted to make sure that he is uh, unfollowable. There were censorship and propaganda during the Stalinist time. There was control over media, control over information. And because of that con uh, control and uncertainty in society, it, it created very deep sense of culture of fear, uh, where the sending voices were silenced. Anyone against, um, against Stalin were silenced. They were shot or um, they just disappeared. So there was no opposition um, for, for Stalin. The random arrests and disappearances was the worst part of fear in society because people never knew why people are being arrested or why they are disappearing. If there is a law in the system and people know that if you do one thing wrong, that you will get jailed, right? 
the the people will reduce or that kind of act will be less in society. For example, if you kill somebody, you will be jailed for 25 plus years or something like that. Then people know what's what to expect if they do such an act, right? So they will not do that or that would be reduced tremendously. But if people don't know why they are being arrested and why people are be disappearing, then there is a, a uncertainty, a known area in society that people um, live in a fear. That is the main definition of uh, cultural fear. Uncertainty, unexpected stuff makes it worse for um, cultural fear. And also there was public trials and that people could watch that people uh, some random people or some opposition will brought out and killed in front of people. That was that is the worst thing. When people watch that, there is a natural creation of fear in society. People see the consequences of doing anything wrong or saying anything wrong. That creates that the um, very deep sense of fear. Uh, in society. So what caused fear in Stalinism, as we are saying here, decolonization and collectivization. So there were farmers in the Soviet Union. They were rich farmers, like rich people, landowners or farm owners. When Soviet Union became a socialist country, the power was centralized, everybody should contribute to uh, the big pot, and there, there was a collective identity, which called collectivization in society, the land was owned by the government, people could work there and make their money, so that was one of the things allowed the Stalinist regime to take better control over people. There was a cotton monopoly in the Central Asia um, because Central Asia had a good climate for cotton. So Stalinist regime created agricultural countries to, um, you know, kind of get all this, what they can do agriculturally. They didn't have to have good uh, manufacturing companies at once uh, technologically, so they just remain as a agricultural countries uh, of the Soviet Union. There was famine uh, because of that. Uh, many were the kulaks or many of the farmers, landowners were uh, killed or they were sent to gulags and then many of them burned their harvest so the wheat and other stuff, because they were very um, upset of Stalin's regime, which, cre which created famine in the country. Um, like in uh, Nazi Germany, the Stalin's regime created um, tremendous fear in society, and people also did not trust one another because of that informants created by the government of uh, Stalin. There is a book, uh, Adip Halid is one of my research uh, committee members. Um, he brought a book, uh, quite few books about Central Asia, actually one of the um, best scholars I know that brought books uh, about Central Asia in the Soviet Union. Uh, one of the books called The Politics of Muslim Cultural Reform, Jadidism in Central Asia. Um, one of the scholars who look into this Jadidism, what is Jadidism? Jadidism is um, Central Asia had their own intellectual peoples who wanted to create the dream of their own country or ideology or uh, future of their country. They wanted to create advancing society that is 
you know, bringing changes to society based on this enlightenment and everything. However, they wanted to keep their um, cultural identity or religious identity. They wanted to keep um, Islam as part of their uh, advancement. However, though, they were purged by the Stalinism to get rid of all these ideologies or all these ideas they had for the future of their country. Uh, they were uh, jaded intellectuals. They called jaded intellectuals. They were Muslim leaders. There were um, there were a kulaks of uh, Central Asia who were rich landowners who was purged uh, in society during the Stalinist time. There was huge differences in um, changes in Central Asia. There is another book by um, Marianne Camp, uh, American scholar. Uh, I personally met her. She is an amazing scholar. She wrote a book called The New Woman in Uzbekistan. As you can see in this picture, women in Uzbekistan or Central Asia had um, head covers before, before the a revolution in Soviet Union took all over the country. So because they were forced to take that uh, head covers, many women, thousands of women were killed by their fundamental husbands or family members in, in, um, in Uzbekistan, in Central Asia, because society was not ready for tremendous changes. The, they, they didn't have time to reflect on the changes or adapt to changes. There was a huge assault on Islam, which I explored in my own research, um, because all these uh, scriptures or all these traditions were erased from society. They did not allow it to practice Islam, learn Arabic, which Quran came in Arabic. People lost their connection with their religion during the Soviet Union. All these cultural artifacts were uh, got rid of, that you know, mosques were closed down or cultural cele celebrations or religious celebrations were not allowed in society. People uh, lost their language because Russian was forced on society. Also, the alphabets were changed and they could not read the books they had before. So all this kind of changes um, happened during that time, which is considered as cultural genocide, similar to what happened to indigenous people in Canada. So the Stalinist regime created secular Muslims in Central Asia. They still called themselves Muslims, but they did not too much about being a Muslim. They, they know few things. They were disconnected from their history. They were disconnected from their culture. They were disconnected from their religion. So they became secular Muslims who could drink alcohol or, or um, there was prostitution grow uh, during the Soviet Union in Central Asian uh, countries. It's part of uh, new changes come to uh, come to the country. Um, people, as I mentioned, women were caught in the middle. They were unveiled by um, by Soviet Union by the new changes, and the fundamentals Muslims uh, were killing women for uh, following the new changes. There are some of the. Um, direct quotations from the Adipalit's book. Um, every morning, the neighbors would ask, so who's been taken away last night? The words back crow were on everyone's, everyone's lips that referred to the car that came in the dip of the night to arrest people. That is how people remember what was happening during during the Stalinist regime in the Soviet Union. So at night, there was a car, a certain type of car that called Black Crow uh, came and picked people up, depending who informed about whom and 
what reason they had for doing so. People didn't even know why people are being arrested. Just in the morning, everybody, uh, you know, that kind of feeling, that fear and something cold, people just tried to figure out who was taken away last night or who were, um, who were disappearing, uh, who disappeared last night. That's just kind of creates such a deep sense of fear in society. And another uh, from the interview, fear enveloped everyone. No one could say anything openly. People were vigilant so that nobody would report on them. The fear was so great that isn't, uh, it's still in our blood to this day. And, and we can see that there is some intergenerational trauma. There is a conversation about intergenerational trauma from fear and control in society. So if we want to theorize fear in Stalinism, I think I would choose number one um, theory as totalitarian control. Um, there is a book by Hannah Arendt. We are going to talk about that in our next classes. She wrote a book called uh, Origins, The Origins of Totalitarianism. And she gives some of the key aspects of totalitarianism in that book we were going to discuss. To give you a little bit idea about that, she says that uh, totalitarianism is a political system characterized by absolute state control over all aspects of society. So everything you can do in society is controlled by the government. You are not free. Like wherever you work, wherever you do your lives, there is no um, autonomy in the country. All aspects of your life is controlled by the government. There is a propaganda. There is atomized people that it seems like a massive people in society, but they don't have connection to one another. They are so, um, they lost trust towards, towards their loved ones as well. Under Stalin, the Soviet state exercised extensive surveillance, censorship, and repression to maintain power. That is basically main part of totalitarian regime. There's surveillance everywhere. As we mentioned that every neighbor surveils the other neighbor or you're sur surveilled at work, you're surveilled in anything. Whatever you do in society, the government knows about that. There is kind of like a ladder kind of uh, centralized system. Anything happens somewhere in society is taken care of by KGB or some other parts of the government. There is a censorship, so whose voices can be heard is controlled by the government. There is no opposition to the government. There is huge repression to maintain uh, control in society. This also includes the establishment of secret police, like as I mentioned that NKVD they called or KGB. They created vast networks of informants. For example, they come to your class and there's somebody in your class tells everything what you say in class. For example, if John says something against uh, a Stalinist government, there is some William hears that and calls this secret police and says, John said so and so. And by the next morning, John is gone. So that kind of thing has happened. When people observe that, they're very careful of what they can say and what they cannot say. So that created, people were surveilling themselves, just the internal panopticon created in society. It created an environment where individuals feared expressing anything or criticizing uh, the government in society. That is how totalitarian uh, state control explains a Stalinist regime during um, Stalinist leadership. The second theory I would 
uh, say is it's a cult of personality and propaganda. Stalin was not a normal person. He was a charismatic leader and he had this uh, personality that he had to present himself as a unstoppable or infallible leader in the embodiment of Soviet Union. He had to be one people viewed as the most powerful person in the world. The propaganda also encouraged that anything propagated in the Soviet Union was kind of glorifying Stalin and demonizing anybody against him, any kind of enemies or people who are viewed as enemies, even they weren't. So because this was such a totalitarian regime, you can think that people being scared, if they weren't scared, they would be against this kind of regime. So the fear was kept in society to maintain that control, fostering a climate of loyalty and fear among the populace. The propaganda, this propaganda machine manipulated collective emotions, creating a sense of national unity through fear of external and internal threats. So if you create enemy in society, people get together to fight against that enemy. So enemy was created from themselves. They were like, there were people against Stalin and people don't know who the enemies were, but they know who the enemies are. Like, they know this people who are against the Stalinist government are enemies, but they don't know who they are. And anybody taken away by the secret police was viewed with that as enemies of Stalin, if you understand me. So they know there is enemies, and when somebody is taken away, that is rationalized by that ideology. Such an uncertainty, and it's not easy to understand what kind of environment this, um, this politics created at that time. For example, I understand there are enemies and they don't like Stalin, but I don't know who they are. And Tomorrow morning, I can find my mother or father, and all of a sudden, I will think I would think that oh, my dad was one of those enemies. Instead of fighting against Stalin, I would question my senses towards my parents. That kind of environment was created during Stalinism in the Soviet Union. And purges and repression was one of the biggest things in the Stalinist regime. Feel during Stalinism was reinforced through mechanisms of social control and surveillance at both macro and macro levels. In the macro levels, all these politicians and opponents to the government were um, massively killed or tortured or jailed. In the micro level, people were losing their loved ones and questioning their integrity to the government. The impact of mass surveillance in society, like neighbors watching another neighbors or the anyone in your society, in your class or in your circle being an informant, and a pervasiveness of fear in everyday interactions were so great. The fear of being reported uh, for perceived disloyalty or doing something wrong uh, or deviation from the party line um, led to the self-censorship and conformity in society. People tried not to do anything that might uh, cause reporting them and, and being a gulag in, in the concentration or labor camps. I actually, uh, I was born in Uzbekistan. I have some personal stories I heard about my grandparents. 
that one day uh, my grandfather says that he was a landowner, that he was one of the wealthy landowners in Uzbekistan. And he says that, you know, this is temporary and we will, you know, gain our power back, like we will get our wealth back. And then next morning he was taken away by the KGB. Our family kind of know, kind of know who was the informant, but you can tell that, you know, it's such a bad feeling. You can't even say who the informant was, even you know it, because even the informant is very close friend or a family member. Terrible feeling. And also, we have to think about the role of ideology in social control and surveillance during Stalinism. There were purges in 20s and there were purges in 1930s, uh, during which millions of Soviet citizens were arrested, tortured, executed, and sent to labor camps. That was the terror created and the, under Stalinism. The social mechanisms created by Stalin enabled all of this, what was happening in society, including uh, the purges, and that was a kind of role of ideology. The, all the systems of legal systems, for example, political systems, uh, law enforcement, all the systems in society, social institutions, were controlled by the government. All of them had to follow uh, the government or there is the dynamics of conformity and obedience within all the social institutions in society. So there was nothing independent. For example, in our society today, we just kind of talk about that judicial system being independent of political system, for example, or you know something like that. There was three different kind of independent institutions in um, um, the, the, that rule is the government, right? But at that time, all of them were centralized and followed the Communist Party and the military. Also, one of the things we can um, relate Stalinism to the residential schools or colonial time in Canada is intergenerational trauma. This trauma is invisible sometimes, and you, you have to think deeply and see what's happening in society to understand what intergenerational trauma is and how it is affecting the lives uh, in today's world. Beyond the immediate political and social implications at that time, there were purges, there were ideological trauma, there were, there were uh, social controls and all of that. There were also a long lasting psychological effects of living under Stalinist terror in the Soviet Union. The constant fear, control, uncertainty, and trauma experienced by Soviet citizens and communities during that period shaped collective memories and behaviors for generations. Even today, I, I believe that society is very afraid of people with the uniform. This is one of the things I observe myself. Here in Canada, we often see that kids, you know, being very friendly with the police guys, which, you know, sometimes we don't like them because they can give us tickets or, you know, just take us to uh, custody if we do something wrong, right? But nevertheless, that um, how society views uh, people in uniform in the Soviet Union and in Canada, I feel the difference. I see the difference. I just kind of sense there is a tremendous uh, intergenerational trauma because of that KGB uh, in the Soviet Union. Understanding how fear becomes institutionalized and internalized within society is one of the key aspects of sociological uh, analysis. We have to understand 
how what kind of fear experienced by the institutions like legal systems, the law enforcement, or secret police, or any other kind of institutions, for example, um, educational system, or any other of them. Uh, and also the internalized um, fear internalized in society, how people collectively experienced uh, fear in society. So this is our um, lecture on Stalinism. If you have any questions, please bring to our discussion board and we will be very happy to discuss this further. For now, uh, have a great day. I'll talk to you soon again.